What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Stray Blade, a Metroidvania action adventure with some mild souls light elements. But before we jump into all that, to get my usual stuff out of the way, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers on the platform. And while that does include the achievements, it also includes a lot more than that. If you're curious about everything that I cover, there's a video linked below that will explain it. You can also go to my channel page if you're not subscribed subscribed and it'll be the first video that you'll see. In addition, my Steam profile is also public and linked below as well. Last but not least, I do have to tell you that I was given a review copy of this game one day before it launched, uh, several days ago now actually, though due to that timing it took me a little while to get the proper review done. But now let's actually start talking about this title. As I mentioned, it's a combination of a few different genres that blend together to make something a little bit different than what you might expect, though at its core it combines elements of of a more Metroidvania style and pulling some small elements from the Souls likes, though very mild in that regard. Mostly I would describe this more as an action adventure. And as we move through this game, gathering power and growing our own abilities, we'll be able to access different parts of the world as we explore and fight ever stronger enemies as we go. Though first and foremost, we're going to start talking with some of the technical stuff with this game or issues you might have. As this is a relatively new title and I usually like to start there with these ones. In that regard, the camera is probably something to be aware of. Sometimes it can be a little cumbersome, let's say, getting you into situations where it's kind of hard to see what's going on, or it'll follow enemies when it really shouldn't in a way that makes it kind of difficult to deal with, which isn't helped along by the targeting system. When you go to attack an enemy, usually it will focus them as your locked on target, though sometimes the camera and everything involved in this doesn't exactly work. Sometimes the enemy will move around you very quickly, causing the camera to spin. Other times, for whatever reason, your character seems to think the enemy is slightly to the left or right of where they actually are, forcing you to have to relock onto them to fix, usually. And then, I didn't see anybody else mention this, but it occurred to me very frequently. Many times, the keys would simply become unresponsive, which at first I thought was because I had run out of stamina, but I did verify that even when I was at full stamina, sometimes the keys would just stop working, and in a fast-paced Souls-like game, that isn't something that's really going to be acceptable, I would say, and it caused me a lot of frustration. Though I will say the game is likely to run for you, I didn't really have any issues there, except on Steam Deck, which we will get to. For now though, let's talk difficulty settings. The reason I would refer to this as a Souls Light is that it is a game with a variety of difficulty options, some of which are pretty customizable, meaning that you're going to be able to make this as easy or as difficult for yourself as you would like, and while you'll pick a preset at the start of the game, once you get into the game, you can also set the difficulty to a custom setting, changing things like enemy health numbers or a variety of other metrics to customize exactly what you want out of this. And because of all these options, unless you are on the absolute max difficulty, it's pretty easy to sort of brute force your way through encounters, even if you're not particularly good at the mechanics themselves, and because of things like unresponsive keys, might come up more than you think. That though does bring us to the story setup for this game. We play as an adventurer known as Farron, who can be male or female. Their face is never shown or anything, so it does kind of give you a blank slate to work with, but your character is named Farron, and you are an adventurer who found the Lost Valley of Acria, a place of legend and myth an explorer like yourself was keen to see. Upon arriving, you find a spire there, and when you come into contact with it, you are blown backwards, and a stone is embedded in your chest. A short ways into the game, you'll run into another creature named Bo who acts as a companion of sorts who explains that that stone is going to prevent you from leaving the valley. If you try to leave, it will kill you. In order to escape, you need to track down three masters of the elements that are unique to the valley, three unique metal alloys here that are magical in nature, and upon mastering each of them, you'll be able to enter the spire where you can find someone who will potentially be able to help you with your problem. So as far as story setups go, it's relatively straightforward 
forward, though the world itself does have a lot of lore associated with it. For instance, you can find out why this valley has become a bit of a war-torn wasteland, what these three magical elements are capable of, what they led the people who used to live here to do, and the things they accomplished in their own lifetimes, as well as, potentially, what happened to them. Overall, I'd say the story's okay. It's likely not going to be anything that really blows you away, but it was certainly serviceable. I would say my main note for it is that it can feel a little bit awkward when you're talking to a creature like Boji, who's supposed to be a sort of miniature wolf, alongside the general art style of the game, which can feel a little bit, let's say, juvenile at times, which is in pretty stark contrast to the more dark scenes where you'll see bodies strewn everywhere, strung up, potentially torn to pieces, etc., which does lend to this feeling that the narrative and the art style don't always jive with what you're actually seeing and participating in when it comes to the combat, though a lot of that's going to come down to personal preference, just something I thought I'd mention here. Now all of that brings us to our progression systems, which is going to come down to things like levels, the various weapons, what Boji can do for you, alongside your equipment and your abilities. So the most bare bones basics of this is that as you kill things, you'll be leveling up. The max level is 50, and every level you'll be granted a skill point to spend on passive abilities. The cat here is that there's only a handful of passive abilities that you can access right away. The rest are locked behind various weapon masteries. As this is a game that likes to have you experiment with various types of weapons to learn their movesets, and there are a lot of them. Killing a certain number of enemies with a certain weapon will eventually lead you to mastering it. Once you've mastered a weapon, this will unlock that weapon's skill point on the skill tree. However, these are passive bonuses, so even though it took that weapon to unlock it, once it is unlocked, it's a passive bonus for everything. But the weapons themselves are quite varied. You can have up to two of them equipped at a time, mostly you'll be crafting them, but we'll get to that. So whatever weapon you have is going to vary up your playstyle substantially. But then we have Boji. Boji acts as our companion, as I mentioned, and while he does not directly aid us in combat most of the time, he does a variety of other things for us. For starters, his runes and abilities. As we move through the game, we can find various runes, as well as at certain story points, Boji will be granted abilities that help you out in combat, such as potentially reviving you upon death, distracting your enemies, or destroying their poise bar. The runes are more consumable in nature. As you move through the area or defeat enemies, you'll loot all sorts of materials for them, some of which are used in rune crafting. These are consumables that attach to your weapon. Each one of them will have a number of charges based on the level it is, because as you move through the world and learn various things about the past, you'll earn knowledge points, which Boji can spend on improving your runes, as well as his own abilities. Then we have our elemental abilities. At certain story points, you'll be granted access to traversal abilities for the most part that deal with a certain element. Eventually, you'll be able to teleport to certain areas or do a big AoE fire attack that damages enemies or creates pathways for you, or one that reveals pathways for you. You. These are both based in exploration and combat. These three abilities are required to access certain parts of the map and move forward, but also they provide potential benefits to combat. One lets you teleport to enemies, the other lets you potentially freeze everyone around you for a couple seconds, that kind of thing. And then last but not least, we have the armor system. Much like the weapons, you'll be crafting this, but the armor, unlike the rest of the game and the weapons in particular, are relatively basic. There's a handful of armor sets that provide you a armor and energy bonus in addition to their physical appearance. One of the things you can find out in the open world is various types of dyes that you can use to change the color of your armor, but the armor has a pretty clear line of progression, I would say, that sees you looking for the most armor and the most energy efficiency, which is going to conserve more of your energy and keep you protected from enemies. I wouldn't say there's like one perfect set, but for the most part, there is one set that will grant you kind of the best of both worlds, which makes all of the armor a little boring, in my opinion, outside of just your physical look. Armor and weapons, however, do have to be crafted which requires you to gather all sorts of materials from defeating enemies and then making your way to a forge. At this point, you'll craft the weapons, 
or the armor, and it's pretty much as easy as that. You'll find the blueprints for this stuff as you explore and defeat various enemies, and you'd be hard-pressed to miss any of it. Though with weapons, there's so much variety you probably won't use all of them. Still pretty important to know. All of that, though, does bring us to our world and gameplay section. So, the world is divided up into four, I would say, hubs. The hubs themselves are open. You can traverse your way around pretty much however you can, really, based on the abilities that you have, and then you'll make your way to certain exit points to travel to new areas. One of the things you can find are called flux mushrooms though, and these act as set fast travel points that make getting around very quick. So we're going to be traversing these four areas, each with their own sort of unique biome and lore behind them, all while trying to unlock more methods of traversal so we can get into new areas, learn new things, find more weapons, find more armor, get at the main story objectives, etc. And for the most part, that's a pretty satisfying gameplay loop when it is not encountering any technical issues like camera problems, etc. The act of exploring and even the combat for the most part is a lot of fun and it's pretty varied based on what weapons you have. Especially because each region of the game tends to have its own sort of enemies in it, which will change as you move in and around the valley. So when you leave and re-enter, what specific enemies are where can change on you, which might lead to an unexpected surprise that leaves you dead on the floor. However, that is of course not the end. There are various shrines throughout the game, but they do not work the same way as a souls likes fires or whatever it is they are happen to work. In this game, the shrines act more like checkpoints. You don't really do anything at them besides revive. Boji will drag you back to the last one you were at and resurrect you, which will restore both your health as well as your healing items and you can get back along the way and you'll revive at whatever it is the last checkpoint you use was, or whichever one is closest in a region if you haven't used any yet. It's also important to know that dying here won't necessarily reset the enemies. Rather, when you defeat a group of enemies, it will say enemies cleared, and if you die nearby after that, they will not respawn for a while at least until you leave the region. So again, if you're not playing on a very high difficulty, it is very much so possible to kind of brute force your way through something like normal. Beyond all of that, however, the act of actually getting through the very various areas can be a little finicky at times. Some of the platforming can be more annoying than it should be, which is largely down to things like the jumping and some of the geometry not exactly being precise, which is a problem in a game that does expect you to do a lot of jumping around obstacles, etc. But by and large, the world is interesting to look at. I especially enjoyed the art style myself, though I admit that won't be to everyone's taste. But for the most part, exploring, looking around, trying to find various secrets, learn more about the world, all of that stuff was handled pretty well and gave you a lot to do. That, however, does bring us to our combat section. Combat is, at its very basic level, a Souls-like, which is probably the only place of this game where that applies, though it's worth mentioning we don't have a lot of ranged options. So most of combat is a melee back and forth that comes down to parrying, dodging, or blocking, or, you know, just getting out of the way, which is probably my first bit of advice, let's call it, because when you first start this game up, it's easy to get into combat with an enemy and get the impression that you're almost dueling someone, but understand that all that's happening there is that you are locked on to the target. You can very much so freely move around still, and later in the game I would highly recommend you do so, as this combat against more than one enemy can be kind of painfully annoying. But as I'm sure you've seen on screen up to this point, enemies will flash either red or blue as they commit to their various attacks. You can also turn on more regular icon indicators in case you have problems with those specific colors, but unfortunately Unfortunately, there's not much to really change that otherwise, which is a bummer if you find the flashing colors kind of annoying, like myself. But it's important that you don't parry or dodge when that color flashes because that will actually just get you hit. That color is simply to indicate the type of maneuver you need to make on the incoming attack. When the enemy actually goes to hit you is what is important. And in that way, it's a more typical Souls-like where there's a lot of staggered attacks or attacks that come very quickly to challenge your response time keep you from panic rolling, all the usual stuff. But where this gets interesting is the large amount of weapon variety. Each weapon has a light, heavy, and special attack. It also has a bunch of stats associated with it, like your control over the weapon, the speed of the weapon, or the reach. As there is no ranged attack, a long sort of melee weapon might have a larger reach than something like a dagger. So playing around with the weapons for the purpose of unlocking your passive skill tree bonuses, but also to find out something that 
that works for you is definitely very important. Though I imagine you'll likely gravitate to one of these special weapons. There are a handful of weapons that have to be crafted at an arcane forge using some of the three special metals you can find around. Each of these weapons has a special attack of sorts that does something a bit more interesting than the regular weapons, even though the damage is comparable. So while they aren't always the best weapon to use in any situation, they tend to be a bit more fun and do more distinct things. Though I will say one of the late game ones is truly broken, as its special attack, if you will, is to stun an enemy for about a second. However, that is enough time for you to spam the attack, which can keep an enemy permanently stunned, even if you're running out of stamina, because when you heavy attack, you actually regain a tiny bit of stamina at the end of it, which means you can just continually use this. So late game, you can use the special ability that freezes all the enemies for a couple seconds and then just permanently stun lock an enemy to death, which includes many of the bosses. Only one of them is immune to this, and there's only like a handful of enemies that are also immune to it. So needless to say, there's a fair bit of cheese you can find, though that one is an egregious case. But beyond the basics of what combat is, there's some good and some bad here. On one hand, I do think the combat feels pretty great. There's a lot of weight to it, and once you get a handle on the system, you can have a lot of fun dodging and parrying your way through enemies, becoming almost untouchable. And when it's working, it's very, very fun. But unfortunately, there are a few problems here that I mentioned earlier that make it frustrating sometimes. For starters, the targeting seems to mess up at times, where despite being locked on to an enemy, your character seems to think that that's not where the enemy is, which forces you to have to re-lock on to fix it. And the problem with this is, is that is usually made worse by the way the camera behaves when you're locked on to a target, especially fast-moving enemies that like to jump around you. This will sort of jerk and spin the camera around very quickly, which is jarring to say the least. But then we also have the occasional problem with responsiveness for the controls, though it is important to note that there is a stamina gauge at play here, so if you're out of stamina and trying to attack, it won't do anything. However, I did notice that even when I had full stamina, sometimes the attack and heavy attack buttons, etc. just did not work, which is just about the worst problem you can have in a game game like this with your combat system. And those problems really get in the way of a combat system that is otherwise pretty fun. That though does bring us to our Steam Deck section, and unfortunately I can't really show you anything here because while there is no official rating, I think this one might get an unsupported rating because it crashed my Steam Deck every single time I tried to play this game. And while there might be a fix for it at some point right now, that's simply not the case. So by all means, if you had a different experience, let me know down below. Because for me, I could load up the main screen, if you will, and then the second I hit new game or continue there, it would completely crash the entire Steam Deck, and it would sort of force a reboot from there. So naturally, I can't really claim that's a good experience, which is unfortunate because I think this game could have had a use case for being some action-packed fun on the go, so to speak. From there, however, we have our positives and negatives, and then we will wrap this thing up. Now, the positive sides for me were the combat and exploration. Exploration. The combat, again, when it works. But when it is working, you've got all sorts of enemy variety, there's all sorts of attacks to use, things to keep track of, and it's a very fun, engaging system that can provide whatever challenge you're looking for based on what you want to do with the difficulty settings. So while it's not exactly a grueling Souls-like experience, it is a lot of fun and can provide you a decent challenge. Then we have the exploration and the world itself, which I thought were interesting. In fact, I personally thought the actual lore and everything Thing that you were reading and finding to be much more interesting than the actual main story was because the main story was just okay, but the exploration of this valley and some of the things they did there were really cool to me. Then on the negative side of this, we have a sort of slew of minor technical issues. Now with any luck, these might be fixed at some point because I don't think they're anything that can't be fixed necessarily, but nonetheless, there is a lot of them. We have the issue with the camera, the unresponsive attack buttons at times, problems with the platform platforming or the geometry and sort of enemies bugging out into walls. And those problems really do put a damper on the experience. Which brings us to our conclusion. So Stray Blade is a game that's going to take you probably 15 to 20 hours. There is no replay value outside of just playing on a different difficulty if you want to, but it's not really necessary as you can change the difficulty settings whenever. 
There's also a variety of small issues, as well as a couple of major ones, and while I did enjoy aspects of the game like the combat when it was working, the exploration, the visual style even, as a total package, for me this is a buy on sale. They're asking $35 for this one, and personally I'd feel better about it in the $20 range, because all in all I had some fun with it, but it's also got a variety of issues that can make it a less than ideal experience much of the time. But if if you happen to catch it on sale and you have a free weekend, I think it might have something to offer for you. So that is all I've got for you guys today. I certainly hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. Let me know how you feel about Stray Blade down below. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.